your attention to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Beginning in verse 13 and 14, the last two verses in 1 Chronicles 10. Sad verses. I'm going to talk, these are a sad chapter of a, two last verses right here recorded. Of a man who started out right, but lost his ways and ended up tragically falling on his own sword and losing his soul. I'm afraid many are losing their way where they need to be with God tonight. People don't have the zeal, the hunger, and enthusiasm. They have left their first love, and they're losing their way. The Bible gives us a warning about losing our way. Amen? Right here is a strong indic warning about one that had no started out right, but turned along the way. Would no longer hear from God and chose to disobey God and go his own path. I think about what Solomon wrote by the Holy Spirit in the book of Proverbs when it says that a man, in a way, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end results of it are the ways of death. Right here, you're going to see that be really coming to fruition right here. Listen to what happened. First Chronicles 10, verses 13 and 14. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. And he inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. Let's go back and read those passages of Scripture one more time. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto, unto David, the son of Jesse. This evening, I want to speak to you on about the thought of a man who lost his ways, about a man who lost his ways. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just come before you this evening, Lord, and we lift you up, dear God. Uh, and we praise you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, uh, for your anointing, dear God. And we ask you, Lord, uh, for your spirit, dear God, to be upon me, dear God, tonight, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray, Lord, for you to give me the words uh, you would have me to speak, oh God. Uh, anoint my lips to speak your word and to proclaim your word, dear God. Uh, Lord, we give you glory we give you honor and we give you praise in Jesus name we pray amen and amen it is it's bad enough to not have known the way but it is in far worse condition to have known the way and turn from the truth of the way after all Peter tells us also it had been better for you one to, for to not have even known the way than to have known the way of righteousness and truth than to have to turn from it. Uh, strong warnings right there. Uh, but right here is a prime example of a man uh, who started out all so right. Uh, who started out along this path. Uh, that man is Saul, the king of Israel right here. Uh, this passage also tells us uh, that there's a horrible consequence uh, of turning away from the Lord uh, and how a great price will be paid uh, if you turn uh, from the way. Um, tonight I want to look at this man they call King Saul. Uh, I want to look at the transgression against God uh, that cost him his kingdom. Uh, that cost him his life uh, by his own hand. Uh, and it also more importantly uh, cost him his soul. Uh, and as a reminder real quickly uh, these passages of scripture uh, are a reminder of the consequences uh, that happens when you turn your back uh, and lose your ways with God. Uh, you see, when 
when I begin to look at Saul, I, I begin to see a man uh, who started out so right. Um, let's understand that Saul was the people's choice uh, for the king. Uh, you see, the people of Israel no longer wanted to be governed by the judges or to be under the theocracy of God. Uh, they were demanding a king. Um, they wanted to be like other nations. Uh, they wanted to be like all of their enemy nations uh, that surrounded him. Uh, so the people began to pester Samuel. They began to complain and demand, uh, we want a king just like uh, all of these other nations. We want a king like all of these heathen nations. Uh, we want to be like everyone else. Uh, I remind you they didn't just reject uh, the prophet Samuel right there, but what Israel was doing right there, they were in turn uh, rejecting God. Uh, but I want you to also know that God in reality was going to give them a king uh, at his appointed time. Uh, but God's choice for, for king was always David. Uh, and Saul was always the people's choice uh, for, ki for king. Uh, and let me tell you when I begin to look at this man uh, that they call Saul, uh, I begin to see a man uh, who started out so right. Uh, he started out on the right track, if you will. In fact, in 1 Samuel 13 and 1, it says Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, looking this up in some commentaries, many of the commentaries will say, give the this reason right here that the first two, that Saul would actually reign in fellowship with the Lord for only two years and the other 38 years were reigning in total disobedience with God think about it how sad it is here was a man who had started out right here was a man who had gone the right way who would be in tune with God but along the way he would lose his ways he would lose the way that brought him two years he reigned uh, in fellowship with God two years he reigned under the direction uh, of almighty God uh, and can you imagine what the other 38 years were like uh, when he was not uh, reigning with God uh, and it shows me somewhere along the path uh, in that time that Saul began uh, to lose his ways uh, it showed me that Saul began uh, to drift away uh, to go even deeper a little bit more with this. We're studying on Monday night in Bible study. We're studying uh, the Ephesus church and the seven churches of Revelation right now. And I begin to think about this. Uh, five out of seven churches uh, along the way in the book of Revelation uh, had lost its way. Uh, they'd be started out uh, on a right track. Uh, they started out uh, doing everything so right. Uh, and going so finely but along the way they begin to lose their way they begin to drift away from the one that brought them there They're the, they begin to drift away from that savior they begin to drift away from the king of kings and the lord of lords you know out of five or seven churches he would tell them to repent or else you'll see as we study I believe it's the Ephesus church uh, he said if you don't repent uh, you'll be cast into you'll be part of the second death uh, in fact you can go on and read what he would tell uh, he would say I would remove thy candlesticks uh, he would tell them what would happen uh, if they refused to repent uh, but he would also tell these churches uh, that there was a blessing uh, in store for them uh, if they would turn back to him uh, but in all seven churches, uh, there was a common message uh, to hear what the Spirit is saying. Uh, that he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit was saying. Uh, but I thought about how tragic uh, those five churches uh, that started along the way, uh, how they started so good, uh, but somewhere along the way, uh, they begin to drift away from God. Uh, they begin to 
drift away uh, from the Holy One of Israel. Uh, they begin to drift away from the one uh, who established the church. Uh, I'm telling you tonight and I begin to think about uh, how many that are sitting on church pews uh, are drifting away from God tonight. Uh, they no longer have the way that they once had. Uh, they no longer have the zeal, uh, the enthusiasm, uh, the hunger. Uh, they no longer have the vision uh, for God anymore. Uh, why? Because I'm telling you people are falling away. Uh, they're losing uh, the way. Uh, they're losing the way that they once had. They're good, better word. They're forfeiting the way. Uh, I think about how many uh, at one time shouted on church pews uh, and praised God uh, but now you can't hardly even get them into a church pew. Uh, some won't even come outright all together. You see we're living in that time that Jesus spoke about uh, where they would be a, where the love of many would wax cold. Uh, we're living in those signs of the end days uh, where people are falling away uh, from biblical truth. Uh, they've lost their ways. Uh, they no longer preach the sense of holiness. Uh, no longer believe in a move of God. Uh, no longer are under the direction of the leadership uh, of the Holy Ghost of God. Uh, they're no longer they're no longer hungry uh, and no longer got that enthusiasm for God. Uh, in fact, let me tell you, many would rather be somewhere else tonight and look for no excuses uh, for excuses not to be in the house. Uh, but what I'm telling you, what is taking place is what Christ talked about uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy. Uh, the Holy Spirit told Paul to write this. Uh, he said that in the last days he said they would be lovers of self and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God and I'm telling you what I begin to see in my spirit what the spirit of God begin to show me is that people are losing their ways people that have started at that been on the right track are now getting their eyes off Christ they're now getting their focus off the Holy One they're now not looking at the Holy One of God but they are now getting starting to look at everywhere else let me tell you many have looked for worldly desires they're looking to the pleasures of this world but I've come by to ask you this evening what shall it profit a man if the man shall gain the whole world and yet lose his souls many people are letting the things of this world distract them from what is truly important. Uh, many people are allowing the things of this world uh, to take them away uh, and their time away uh, from the God of Israel, uh, from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, many are drifting away. Uh, they're no longer got that hunger and that thirst uh, for God like they need to have. Uh, many that sit on church pews, uh, they're sitting there and without any hunger without any enthusiasm many are just saying I'll be glad when the preacher's done where we can get out of here tonight amen but I'm telling you this evening people are attracted to the things of this world they've got their eyes on these things that are temporary and I've come by to tell you tonight that we ain't to look at the things of this world we're not to look at the things which are seen because the things which are seen are temporary. But what did Paul tell us? He told us by the Holy Ghost that we are to look at the things which are unseen because the unseen things are eternal. Oh, he also says to set our affections on things above and not on things below. How many know that Jesus told us tonight to lay up your treasures in heaven? You see, but people's got their treasure here. You see, when your treasure Treasures here on this earth. Can I tell you something? It's going to corrupt. The thief's going to steal it. And the moth is going to be around it. But Jesus told us, My Lord, can I preach tonight? I'm telling you. But Jesus told us this evening. He told us in the Word of God that when the treasure's in heaven, can I tell you? 
It ain't going to be stolen. When the treasure's in heaven, it's not going to be corrupt. When the treasure's in heaven, the moth ain't going to be around it. Let me tell you, if you think this world's got something to offer you, I got news for you. You've lost your ways tonight. When you begin to think the system of this world has got something for you, you ain't got a proper perspective. You're not looking after Christ tonight. Because when you look at Christ, you'll realize this world ain't got nothing for me. You'll realize this world ain't got nothing joint for you. You see my joy don't come from this world. My joy comes from the Lord Jesus Christ this evening. I said my joy comes from the Lord tonight. People are losing the way because they're drifting away. They got their eyes on this world. Hello, if I ain't got you yet, I'll get you. Saul began to drift away. I don't know if it was position or power. Sometimes that will draw somebody away from God. Sometimes it's the cares of life. Amen? If you wasn't here this morning, go on YouTube or Facebook and look at the message. Because I told you. God's, God is sufficient for the cares of life. We think we got to take care of all these needs. We've got to place this. We worry about this. We worry about that instead of our relationship with God. But Jesus told us on the Sermon on the Mount, He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. What He was saying is, Keep your eyes upon me, seek me, place me first. Then He said, I'll take care of your food, I'll take care of your shelter, I'll take care of your clothing, and I'll take care of your thirst. Do you hear what I'm telling you tonight? But yet, many times, we allow the cares of life. To, we get our eyes on the cares of life. We begin to see the lack. Did you hear me? How many know people begin to look at the lack? Amen? People begin to see the lack and think, well, I've got to do something for about this. Oh, i got a lack here. I've got a lack here. Well, I go back to this morning and tell you what little you have if you put it in God's hands, if you put it in the hands of the Lord, He will transform it. You see, they put five loaves and two fish into the hands of Almighty Lord Jesus Christ. And can I tell you, He fed 5,000. Can I tell you tonight, not only did he feed 5,000 they picked up 12 baskets full of fragments uh, that fed the disciples uh, but too many times we want to try to look at these things uh, and we get our eyes off the Lord uh, I've come by to tell you tonight uh, if you keep your eyes on God uh, instead of the things of this world uh, instead of the cares of life uh, you'll be in a whole lot better shape uh, how many know that tonight uh, somebody needs to say uh, I've got to keep looking towards heaven tonight. I'm not going to look towards my problem. I'm not going to see the lack. I'm going to see the sufficiency of God. Amen. Oh, but I tell you, when you begin to look at other things but God, you begin to drift away and you begin to lose your way. Those five churches in Revelation were got their eyes off the Lord and when they got their eyes off the Lord, they begin to drift away. Saul began to lose his way when he would not heed the word of God. Amen. He lost their way. Hey, man, think about it. Oh, I want you to know tonight, the devil don't want you sitting. The devil don't want you serious with your walk with God. Oh, he don't mind you lukewarm. He don't mind you coming in here, sitting down. Hey, man, he don't mind if you're cold, but he sure don't want you hot and on fire. Hey, man, because if you're lukewarm or cold, he's got you. But he wants to get you distracted. Because when you get distracted, you begin to lose your ways. Amen. I'll give you a good example. You miss one service, it's easier to miss another service. It's the same way with reading your Bible. You miss one day reading the Bible, it gets easier to miss another day. One day without prayer, it gets easier to go another day without prayer. 
Why? You say, well, I don't have, if the devil can get you distracted and get your eyes off God and he gets your eyes off the Lord, cannot, and you begin to have a wandering eye, you'll begin to lose your ways. Amen. Will you begin to lose your ways? Saul was a man who started out right, but he lost his way along the path. Let me tell you, Ephesians 4 and 27 tells us right here, neither give place to the devil. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I can't help it if he comes to my door. Ooh, I'm going to preach here for a few minutes. But once who I see who it is, I sure don't have to allow him to come in. Amen. Amen. Too many times we allow the devil to come in. We open the door to let him come in. Amen. See, I'm telling you today that Satan wants you distracted. I'm telling you this, that this night that Satan wants to, will place things before you even though they may seem good, to distract you from your, get your eyes off the Lord. Did you hear me? The enemy will put something, it may seem right. It may be something you need. He'll put things right there to try to get you away from God. Can I'm going to tell you right now, you hear my words. If anything draws you away from the Lord, then God's not behind it. Did you hear me? Oh, you're a little silent on there. If it takes you away from the Lord, God is not behind it. Amen. God ain't going to give you, bring something in your life that draws you away from Him. Amen. God's not going to put something purposely there to draw your attention away from Him. In fact, I'm convinced that God will place things in our life that will draw us closer to Him, that will make us look to Him even more. But yet many people begin to get that wondering eye, and all they see is how green it is from the outside. You see, Lot saw the, green, the plain of Sodom. He saw how green and how beautiful it was on the outside but Lot could not see the inside of it because the inside of Sodom was racing towards the judgment of God the inside of Sodom was dark it was ugly it stunk it smelled like sewage and it was racing towards damnation that God was going to destroy those wicked cities but that's what people are looking toward tonight See, what begins to happen is people begin to lose their way with God when they begin to listen to the devil, when they begin to listen to self. I go back and I remind you, there's a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end result is the way of death. Saul had the right start. For the first two years, man, he was under the leading. But somewhere along the way, he began to lose his way. Started so right. Let me tell you, you may start right, but you better worry about where you, if you finish right. Amen. Amen. Here is a story right here of a man who started right but did not finish right. His story is a sad chapter. Started right but along the way as he began to drift, as he began to go his own way, own accord, he began to disobey God. Amen. It seems Saul didn't like to listen. Did you hear what I'm telling you? He didn't want to hear what the prophet had to say. He didn't want to obey. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. He thought because he was king, he could do whatever he wanted to do. Amen. He failed to realize that there was one that was watching him. He was put to the test. You see, when you look in 1 Samuel 13, we see the disobedience of Saul. In an act of transgression against God. When he was told to summon the people to giggle and there wait seven days for him. No doubt this was a test for Saul. 
to see whether Saul would subject, subject himself uh, to God's will or act uh, in, the, in the energy of his own. And you will see, if you read that, uh, that Saul did not pass the test uh, and he went on uh, to burn the sacrifice anyway. Uh, no doubt Saul was told what to do, but Saul had a problem of listening. Uh, he wanted to do what he wanted to do. He wanted to have it his way. Let me tell you right here is a sign that Saul had already gone downhill right there when he decided to do things his way instead of God's way. When he decided to be directed by self and not by the Lord God Almighty. Oh, what are you saying? I'm telling you that Samuel the prophet, he went and rebuked that old king Saul. But despite the rebuke, Saul would truly not repent. He would not repent of his transgression and his act of disobedience. Another case of incomplete obedience. And let me tell you, incomplete obedience is total disobedience in the eyes of God. It ain't no such thing. You Some would say it's partial. But I'm telling you the way God looked at it because he failed to do one part right here he was in total defiance to God what are you saying when God told Saul the king of Israel to smite the Amalekites Saul would but Saul would smite the people but Saul would spare Agag the king to live along with the best of his sheep it got Samuel to say right there it, it repented him that he he was made king over Israel. You see, God was wanting the Amalekites wiped out because if Israel did not wipe them out, the Amalekites would fight and destroy them. You have to understand that, why God would lead that in the direction. God said, if you don't wipe them out, they'll wipe you out. In essence, where it comes down to. Because they're so wicked. They were the enemies of Israel. But Saul would not listen Saul said, well, I wiped out the majority, but I'm going to leave the king, and I'm going to leave his best sheep, if you will. God looked at this as a total act of rebellion. God saw this as total disobedience. It wasn't just partial obedience, it was disobedience. If you want to know what God thinks about it, here's the drifting away of Saul. A man that lost his way. How do you know when somebody ain't right with God? Let me tell you, they're in total disobedience. They do not like to listen. They do not like the authority of the Word of God. Listen to what I'm telling you right here. Listen to what God says right here. In 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. And Samuel said to the Lord, As a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrificing, as in paying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to, hear and to hearken than the fat of rams. Listen, he goes on in verse 23 to say, That for rebellion is as the sin as witchcraft and stubborn is as iniquity and idolatry. Listen what I'm telling you. Let me tell you, listen, go on. Because Saul had rejected the word of God, listen to what God said. Because you have rejected the word of, God, of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. There's consequences for not listening to God. There's something that's going to happen even further if he would not repent. His drifting would cost him more than just his kingship. But there's something to think about. God puts rebellion and witchcraft together. You don't want to hear, listen to the word of God. You got a rebellious attitude to the word of God. In the eyes of God, that's nothing more than witchcraft. Amen. You're stubborn in your ways. Don't want to heed to what God's saying. This is what God was saying about Saul. His rebellion was his witchcraft. 
His stubbornness was idolatry and iniquity in the sight of God. My Lord, think about how a man who started out right, now God was saying, that his disobedience, his rebellious attitude, that he was wrapped up in witchcraft, idolatry, and iniquity. Started out so right, but drifted away already to this point. Do you see what begins to happen as you begin to drift away? You begin to no longer heed the word of God. Repentance don't really concern you. The only one you're looking at is yourself and what you want to do. See how far Saul would come. It shows you how fast someone can deteriorate in the sin. Now let me tell you, this didn't happen overnight. How many know that? This happened over a process of time. And I can't help but to think, even though it, we know there's times as recorded and, even th- and there's probably times when it ain't recorded before he got to this point. I, we know Samuel the prophet had rebuked him. We, I can't help but to believe that God on times, maybe not even recorded in Scripture, would send that prophet, send the word to Samuel to try to get him to turn. But the more he closed his ears to the word of God, the more he closed his ears to what God was saying, the deeper and deeper in sin he would go. Oh, we're going to get there in a minute. But I'm going to tell you right now, Saul's problem is the cause of every broken home, wasted life, and warped mind in, in this world today. And it's an attitude of rebellion against God's Word. Amen. Amen. People don't want anything to do with God's Word. They don't want anything to do with the remedy before it. They rejected God's standard. They rejected His prescribed order of life. And that is through Jesus Christ. How many know the reason our society is going to hell in a handbasket is because they rejected Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm going to say it tonight. The reason we got people saying we'll kill these babies even if they survive abortion is because they rejected Jesus Christ tonight. The reason these abortion clinics are open in this country is because they rejected Jesus Christ tonight. The reason we're legalizing dope in this land is because they legalize, because they rejected Jesus Christ. Oh, we'll go deeper. The reason we're legalizing perversion is because we've rejected Jesus Christ. We've got a rebellious attitude in this land. And not in this land, but in the house of God. Judgment begins in God's house. Amen. We forgot the standard of God. We forgot righteousness and unrighteousness. People can't tell the difference anymore. Amen. Amen. Forgot it. I'm telling you, you'll mark my words. If the Lord tarries, you're going to see it grow deeper and deeper. It ain't just going to be the babies they're going to kill. If you got, if you're elderly, you're next. If you're sick, you're next. Here's what they'll say. Well, it's just taking up taxpayers' dollars. I'm going to tell you, you don't believe that. I know a man that was said to. I know a gentleman in North Carolina passed away. They could have given him medicine to live a little while longer, but the doctor's reply to him was, why waste taxpayers' dollars to give you that medicine? Oh, it's there. It's been here. You ain't seen anything. Amen. Because the deeper they reject the word of God, the deeper in sin a society will become. The more we drift away from the standard of God's Word, the more we'll see sin grow deeper and deeper. My Lord, 
20 years ago, I'd have never thought men would be carrying purses and wearing makeup and wearing skirts and marrying other men. <laughs> did you? Did you ever think you'd see that in your day? Men who think genderless babies. Let that baby decide whether it's gender. I got news for them. It's either male or female. <laughs> It ain't hard to figure it out. But did you ever thought you would see that? Seriously. But as we digress from the ways of God into an act of disobedience and rebellion, you go deeper and deeper into sin. It's a process. I don't know how much more he'll let it go on. But I'm going to show you. How many know? Let's start with Adam and Eve from the fall. Let's go to Cain and Abel. Brother killed brother. Well, let's go from Cain and Abel all the way to Noah's day. It went downhill. Let's go from Noah's day to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let's go from Sodom and Gomorrah and jump over time and go to where we are right now. Do you see the digression of sin? You see how deeper we get in sin. Not only that, let me tell you something. Look at the Bible and look at the life expectancies in the Bible. How many of them, and look to where we are right now with life expectancy. Because sin. Amen. It didn't get happen over just overnight. It's a process of time that's still taking effect. Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? The Father people drift from God. The Father we get away from the Bible and the words of God. And we, we begin to lose our ways. My Lord, did you ever thought? I'm just going to tell you something, and this was very interesting. Anybody here at Muslim woman, anti-Semitic words, they drafted a resolution trying to condemn her. It really wasn't nothing against her. But I was listening to somebody. Somebody said, this is what this is going to be the start of. They'll use it in the long run. They'll try to use this to try to silence the church. Amen. Sin, we're preaching hate against sin. Amen. I'm telling you, we're here. We're here. I never thought I'd see today. Let me tell you right now, real quick. America don't need to really worry about its outside enemies when we got inside enemies destroying it from itself. Amen. You see, as we transgress against the word, as we depart from the word of God and go into that rebellious witchcraft attitude, the deeper one becomes in sin. Amen. They become deeper in that sin. And this world is going more and more wicked because they have departed from God. The more society accepts sin and rejects God's word, it will become more wicked. And I'm telling you, I'm afraid this is what is happening right now. I'm afraid this is what's happening on many that sit on pews and stand in pulpits. That we begin to a point where we get comfortable with it. And begin to say it's all right when it's not all right. Amen. Think about how Saul would grow deeper and deeper into sin. This act of disobedience. He would become jealous of David. I'm not going into all of them. I'm not, if I preached on everything Saul went into tonight, I'd be, we'd be here the rest of the night. Amen. He made David a fugitive. David become a fugitive. It got to the point where Saul wanted to kill David. It's interesting to note that Saul... That David could have killed Saul, but David would not touch him. That's interesting to note right there. Let me tell you something else about Saul. He was full of pride and self-will. Man, he had departed from starting out right. But he, as he refused to repent, he was growing deeper and deeper to God in sin. He was rejecting God, and he was grow going deeper and deeper. It got to a point, he grew so much in sin, but Saul went so far 
that 1 Samuel 28 and 6 said, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophet. It got to the point where God would not answer. I want to tell you something. You can, let me tell you. Somebody, I've been in services where God literally said not to pray for people. Oh, you don't believe it. Well, God told the prophets not to pray for Israel before. Amen? Read it. Because they were so deep in sin. Don't even pray for these people. God said it. It got to so point. Saul would not listen. Saul would not hearken. That it got to so he got so deep in sin that God would no longer answer him. Ain't that a scary thought? To drift so far from God, to reject God so much. Saul, it's Saul's fault. I have no doubt God tried to get his attention. How many know God tried to get his attention? God tried to pull with him. I have no doubt about that. But Saul rejected the word of God. And as he rejected the word of God, God finally said, enough was enough. I'll no, you will no longer hear from me, Saul. You don't want to hear what I'm telling you. You don't want to hear what I'm saying. You don't want to turn and repent. You will no longer, I'll no longer answer you. But I'll tell you this, if Saul would have truly repented, he would have heard from God. But Saul truly would not repent. Oh, I'm going to say something. If you don't think you're hearing from God this evening, maybe you need to search your life out. Ooh. Did you hear what I'm telling you? Because unconfessed sin will hinder your prayer life. God got to the point with Saul, you ain't go, I'm not, you ain't going to answer you. You'll inquire, but I'm not going to answer you. It got so bad for Saul. Can I tell you? Saul, would, when God would not answer him, in his refusal to repent, he went to something that was outlawed. He went to a witch. He turned to the occult. Do you see where he's went to? From the first two years, he started out. To where he is right now. That he turned to witchcraft for an answer. He turned to demonic spirits if you will. He turned to the devil. Oh my Lord. I know this may be a little off topic. But I'm going to tell you right now. We've got a country and many that have turned from God. And are looking for answers from these ungodly demons. Amen. Just a few years ago, I can't even remember his name. He was a senior advisor for some in Washington. They would have summonings. They would have dark games where they would summon Satan. I don't know if anybody heard. I'm going to bring the NFL into this. Anybody hear about Tom Brady's wife or girlfriend or whatever she is? It's been more, this ain't just some individual source, but it has been covered by multiple sources that she said that she th gives him a good luck spell before she goes out, he goes out there in every game. Witchcraft. In high pla places we least expect it. It's in D.C. People are looking for answers. They're running to Allah. Ain't it a shame? I'm going to say this right here. That we've got more, they've more Muslims been elective in this last term than ever before in this country. We're running to everything. Maybe I'm telling you where they're looking to answers from where places they don't need to be looking. They're looking for answers from the powers of darkness. But let me tell you tonight, if you want an answer from God, let me tell you if America wants an answer from God, they're going to have to humble themselves before the Lord Jesus Christ and repent and turn from their wicked ways. Amen. Oh, I see a pattern. Oh, let me tell you, Saul, 
had gone farther than where than he ever intended to go. How many know he went farther than he probably ever intended to go? He never intended to get to this point. Sin will take you farther than you will ever intend to go. You look around, those that's bound by sin. They went farther than they've ever intended to go. People who have backslidden on God have gone farther than they've ever intended to go. People who have lost their ways along the path just seems like a good comfortable evening. Maybe I can put it off to the bar. Have gone farther than they ever intended to go. And let me tell you, Many, just like Saul, are refusing to repent because they don't see the error of their way. It's called a hardening of the heart. Amen? People's hearts been hardened. They refuse to repent because they don't want to hear it no more. They've hardened their heart and justified it what they want. Can I preach a little while tonight? They want preachers that'll tell them it's all right. Well, if you want me to tell, if you're lax tonight, I'm not going to tell you it's all right. I'm going to tell you, you need to get on fire tonight. Amen. If you're bound in sin tonight, I'm not going to pat you on the back, but I'm going to tell you about Jesus tonight. Amen. Let me tell you, I'm going to preach it like God gives it to me. I'm telling you, we don't want to hear it no more. People don't want to hear it no more. But sin goes farther than one would ever intended for it to go. What seems so bad? What seemed so harmless, what seemed something that wouldn't hurt so bad, has been brought, will take you deeper than one ever intended. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. But also, let me tell you more importantly, sin is a transgression against God. It is an act against God. Saul's transgression was... An act against God. That's what sin is. But because of that, let me tell you, Saul would face the consequences. Let me tell you, there was a, there was a consequence for the transgression. Now, Lord, he would lose his kingdom. Ain't bad. Think about God not hearing you. That's bad. But it gets further deeper. Turn, going over to witchcraft. But it gets further. Verse 13. We go back into verse 10. We see right here that he died for his transgressions. That he did against the Lord and against the word of God. We are told right there as we go back into verse 4. I believe it's where it's at. Then said Saul to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith. Least these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. And listen to this. This is sad right here. So Saul took a sword and fell upon it. You know what Saul done? It got so bad, his transgression, his refusal to repent. That he took his own life. Folks, this is sin. This is what sin does. It's no joking matter. This is what happens when one loses their way from God. They go deeper than they ever intended. One that started out so right, finished so bad, and so sad. How many? That are so lukewarm are going to miss heaven because of their lukewarmness. How many is going to miss the rapture when it comes? Amen. Romans 6 and 23. Let me tell you what Paul said. What Saul happened. Happened to Saul. Tells us something. For the way in Romans 6 and 23. Paul said it like this in the book of Romans. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Not only does it take you farther than you intended to, but it will cost you more 
than you even realize. It will cost you more than anything that you even realize. You see, Saul refused to correct the issue. Don't be blaming God for this. I can hear them. Why did God do this? Why? God gives Saul ample opportunity to repent and to turn course. But he would not turn course. I'll even parallel this. I, I believe this is even a picture of a nation that turns from God that started out so well that you'll die from within. Amen? By your own hand. I think you can parallel that to where we are right now. Uh, honest to goodness, maybe I'm reading a little more into this, maybe I'm not. But I can see how Saul can be a picture of a nation or a people that turn from God, but, you'll, but you'll, if you don't turn back, you'll die from within. Amen? Listen, it's no joke. Let me tell you, Saul would face consequences in this life for his actions of disobedience. And he had faced consequences eternally. And Pop, he would not correct the issue by sincerely repenting. God's mercy and grace was there. Through what God could have struck him down from the very first act of disobedience. I have no doubt God dealt with him. No doubt Samuel rebuked him. An open rebuke, by the way, is better than secret love. Amen? Think about it. But let me tell you, because it's his refusal to repent, the slide would just continue to go down hill. Individuals, people, church, if you're sliding tonight and you don't turn back to God and get where you need to be, your slide will just continue to go down. You can't blame the preacher. You can't blame the people that's sitting beside of you. You'll just need to look at the people in the mirror. Look at the one facing you in the mirror. You'll see a reflection of yourself. People in hell, it's because they trampled under the grace of Jesus Christ. No one can blame God sending them to hell. They made that own choice to reject him. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you. Nation, America, here's, a, here's something for this country. If you want a word about this country, if America does not truly repent before God, and it must start in the house of God, the slide will continue to go on down if we don't get back to God's word. Amen. You ain't seen nothing yet if we don't turn back. Not only that, let me tell you, Saul died by his own hand. And I'm going to tell you again, it is possible America will die by its own hand if it don't turn back to the Word of God. Think about it. It cost him his life. It, co it cost him his kingdom, his life, and it cost him, more importantly, his soul. The price of disobedience was high. And it's still high. And it, he will pay that price for all of eternity. For rejecting God. Started out so right. But as he lost his ways. Nowhere did he turn. The sad thing is. They were opportunities. In those 38 years. To turn back. But he would not turn back. God had given him ample opportunity. Now for all of eternity, he would reject it. If you don't think the price is heavy to transgress against God, ask Adam and Eve. I'm going to leave it there. Ask Achan and his family. Stealing from God cost Achan and his family their house, lives. It cost Israel a victory that day. Ask Judas Iscariot who sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Marcy, you can get ready to come. And you can rem remember, there's a countless multitude who has rejected him. 
and would not heed his word that are paying the price tonight. You see what I'm saying? Sin has a penalty. Sin has a wage attached to it. And that penalty is death. But it also tells us something else in Romans 6. Let me just say this, first of all. It tells us something else. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. But it also tells us something else. That there's a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, I don't want to just sit here and preach on how one man lost his way without telling somebody, you can recover the way. You can go back to the path. You can get straightened out again. Amen. Amen. And that is through Christ. You see, I can't, that prodigal son, let me tell you, there was a prodigal son that left home. Oh, he got deep in sin. He got deep in it. He spent all that he had. I like to say it like this. He was surrounded by the pigs but couldn't eat the ham and sausage. Amen. <laughs> Me around all those pigs but couldn't eat that ham and sausage and that bacon right there. <laughs> he couldn't eat it. Listen. But he come to himself and come back. And guess who was there waiting for him? The father was waiting for his son to come home to bestow the best robes and to have a feast in the celebration of the prodigal that came home. You see what I'm telling you tonight? You may lose your way. You may start slipping along the way. But where sin abounds, the grace of God abounds that much more. The Father's there with outstretched arms saying, Come home for those who begin to slip from their ways. Everyone standing in here this evening, every head bow closed. I'm going to give this altar call like this tonight. You know it. You and God know this. I don't know where you stand. But is anyone under my, my voice that says I've lost my ways from where I once was? My passion, my zeal, my obedience to God ain't like it once was. God's saying, come. Hear what I'm saying tonight. Hear what I'm saying tonight. God's saying, come. Come home. Come home. I got outstretched arms. I'm calling you home tonight. I'm calling you home tonight. I'm calling my prodigals back home tonight. Don't finish like Saul finished. Finish right. I'm going to tell you tonight, he's got his hand there. And my Bible says, if we confess, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us. Lord, I want to come home. I want to come home. Oh, I want to finish right. I may have strayed along the way, but I'm coming back on the right path tonight. I'm coming right back on the right path tonight. I'm coming right back on the right path tonight. I'm coming back on the right path tonight. Oh, in the name of Jesus, every life hard in here. We ask you, God, just to touch. We ask.